In this video, we take a look at Boeing's Starliner spacecraft and the orbital flight test OFT-2. So let's talk about that. Welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoyed that new introduction animation. I'm trying to incorporate some new animations to these videos. But in this video, we're going to be talking about Boeing's recent orbital flight test, standing the acronym OFT-2. Now this is a flight test of their Starliner spacecraft, which is aiming to send crew to the International Space Station. But in this video specifically, we're going to primarily be focusing on the OFT-2 flight test itself. So we're going to break it up into a few different segments. First, we're going to do a brief overview of the entire mission. Then we're going to go into a little bit more detail in terms of three main components of the actual project or the test, including the launch, the docking with the International Space Station, and re-entering the atmosphere. We'll talk about those three separate phases and finish the video off by discussing what the future of Boeing Starliner will achieve. So with that being said, let's get started with talking about the overview of the OFT-2 mission. On May 19th of 2022, Boeing's Starliner launched from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Now this launch took place on an Atlas V rocket owned and operated by the United Launch Alliance or ULA. Now there are many stunning videos taken during liftoff, including this one from just below the rocket engines at ignition. And after a half hour, the vehicle successfully reached a desired low Earth orbit. Once Starliner was in space, it took roughly a day to approach the International Space Station. And it gradually made its way through various checkpoints or safety checkpoints before docking with the space station itself. Now there were a couple delays throughout this process, but ultimately, roughly after a day after the launch initially, Starliner successfully docked to the International Space Station. The next day, on May 21st of 2022, the astronauts on board the International Space Station opened the hatch for the very first time, making their way into Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. Now, on their way inside, there was various inspections, but after opening the hatch, they were able to release or tell everyone what their zero-g indicator was. And on board was a stuffed version of Jeb Kerman from the video game Kerbal Space Program. So after the hatch was open and they went through various inspections, the astronauts on board started to move the cargo from Starliner into the space station. In fact, this ended up being around 225 kilograms of cargo or 500 pounds that they returned back into the space station. And before Starliner undocked a few days later, they put around 270 kilograms or 600 pounds back into Starliner to return to Earth. Which led to just three days after they opened the hatch on May 24th of 2022, Starliner's hatch was officially closed and the vehicle undocked from the space station. From there, it began its return back to Earth. About a day later after the undocking on May 25th, Starliner re-entered the atmosphere and successfully landed on land in New Mexico, which was what was intended. And that ended the OFT-2 mission. So now that we have kind of an understanding of what the entire mission looks like, we can go a little bit further into the details of different components such as the launch, the docking, and the re-entry phase. So let us begin with the launch. Now I mentioned before that it was launching on top of an Atlas V rocket that is owned and operated by the United Launch Alliance or ULA. Now this is Boeing's Starliner spacecraft, so why are they launching it from a different company? Well, it turns out that ULA is actually jointly owned by Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Therefore, even though it's operated by a slightly different company in name, there are still connections between Boeing Starliner and the Atlas V rocket. Therefore, that's one of the reasons why we see Boeing launching on terms of an Atlas V and maybe not using a Falcon 9. Now for the sake of time in this video, I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of the Atlas V rocket itself because that could take many videos all by themselves. So if you're interested in learning about the Atlas V, let me know in the comments below. But we can continue going into the details of the launch. After the launch began, the first stage would continue to ascend the spacecraft for roughly four and a half minutes. 
At this point started the first stage separation, where it went from the main boosters to the second stage, where on the Atlas V, for this case, it's called the Centaur, which would continue to burn for another 7 minutes or so, taking Starliner to a low orbit. But after the Starliner spacecraft was separated from Centaur, it still needed to perform a slightly larger burn in order to get to the right altitude or the right orbit to dock with the International Space Station. Therefore, the vehicle waited another 16 minutes until they performed their final burn that targeted the desired orbit that they wanted to reach the ISS. While Boeing Starliner was trying to reach its desired orbit and perform this burn, there was a slight malfunction. Two of the OMAC engines ended early. But what are OMAC engines and where are they? Well, the OMAC is an acronym standing for the Module Orbital Maneuvering and Attitude Control Engines. And it turns out that there's a total of 20 OMAC engines on board Starliner. So that might not necessarily sound too bad, two out of 20, but it's also important to mention that only 12 of those engines are on the aft or back of the spacecraft. So when those 12 engines are on, they're essentially pushing the spacecraft forward. It took me a little while, but I was able to find an image from the underside of Starliner before it was lifted onto the Atlas V. And here we can see six of those thrusters represented as those small circles on the side. Now there are additional six that are just out of view in this image, but essentially what happened is as Starliner was trying to reach its desired orbit, one of them malfunctioned and then it moved to a different one, and then that one also malfunctioned. So two of those thrusters weren't working as expected. Now during this burn, they did actually need 10 thrusters to perform the maneuver. Now they might have been able to make up with fewer, but for this case, they were still able to reach their desired orbit. So it's just interesting to note that there were a couple complications during this phase. And after the, they reached their desired orbit, NASA and Boeing announced that they would continue to approach the ISS, but maintain or observe what was going on with these specific thrusters. As I had mentioned before, after they reached orbit, it took roughly a day to get to the International Space Station and then dock with the station. So what does the process entail? Well, there are actually many steps or procedures that have to be gone through. And according to some of the NASA live streams, there are 11 different checkpoints that they have to make their way through. Now the first five of those checkpoints are essentially getting to the desired orbit, changing things such as the orbital inclination and altitude, as well as trying to just reach the vicinity and detect the space station as a whole. Whereas the six through 11 steps focus on starting at a roughly one kilometer away from the space station and gradually making their way closer, getting to various checkpoints and performing certain safety checkouts in order to get to somewhere where they feel confident enough that they can dock with the station. Now Starliner actually has a navigational system on board that is called VESTA. And VESTA stands for the Vision Based Electro Optical Sensor Tracking Assembly. The VESTA system, from the acronym you might be able to guess, relies on optical tracking, meaning it's relying on the light emitted from the space station in orbit to arrive successfully to their desired location. Now, although it is autonomous, there are still people here on Earth that are helping navigate the spacecraft and put it at different holding zones before it can get even closer. So it's kind of a combination of what the spacecraft is able to see and do on its own, with what is happening here on the ground. So one of the first steps is when the spacecraft is still pretty far away from the station, and it can actually pick up the light emitted, but it can't detect any of the features. Therefore, it sees the relative orientation and is able to slowly or gradually approach towards station. Then, as it gets closer to roughly a kilometer or so, it's able to switch in that it can start to detect actual features on the space station. And here's an image from the actual docking process itself. Here you could start to see the truss of station as well as the solar panels, and the computer on board is trying to match that to what it knows the station looks like. Therefore, it's able to get the right orientation or attitude for this given approach. This is called silhouette mode. Now, as it continues to approach the station, even though there are some holds, essentially the last component of VESTA is when it is actually about to dock with the docking port. 
In this case, rather than looking at features that entail the entire space station, it looks at components that are very close to the docking port, such as stickers or different structural components that it can identify in order to know that it's at the right orientation. So it was pretty interesting to see during the docking process these different components arise and how that actually ties into the design of the mission. But as I mentioned, there are various steps and safety checks before it can actually dock. And some of these locations are around a kilometer out, 250 meters, 200 meters, and then finally 10 meters. Now there was a slight challenge with the docking process as well that caused a delay. In this case, once it got up to the 10 meter distance, or right before it needed to dock, they had to retract and then re-extend their docking ring before they could go into the final approach. So ultimately what this means is they had to wait just outside of the region before they could finally approach station. But it's pretty interesting to note, and if you were watching the live stream, that for over an hour, Starliner was able to keep its position very close to the station in that it had to do a few more things before it could finally arrive. So after the successful docking of the Starliner spacecraft with the International Space Station, Boeing had announced that two of 28 reaction control system thrusters had actually malfunctioned or ended prematurely. So again, it's kind of a challenge that some of these thrusters aren't operating, but again, that is why this is an orbital flight test. And that is why there are redundancies in these thrusters because two out of 28 isn't necessarily that big of an issue. So therefore, they were able to continue with the mission as expected. And actually, later on in the mission, they were able to get those reaction control system thrusters up and running. So that was just something that they ran into a dilemma upon arrival at the space station. However, the controllers on the ground were able to make up for that challenge and continue to successfully dock. There was also a slight challenge with their thermal control system where there was some coolant that wasn't working as expected. However, since the Starliner's atmosphere, or essentially interior, was still a stable temperature, they were able to dock as we would expect. But these again are minor challenges that will be assessed over the coming months and preparing for future launches. So the last phase of this mission that we'll discuss in further detail is re-entry. And this is after the spacecraft had undocked from station successfully, had been able to reassess the reaction control system or RCS thrusters, and then depart from station. At this point, it was able to deorbit itself and then re-enter the atmosphere, arriving in one of their desired landing zones. Now this is slightly different if you're familiar with Crew Dragon, which lands in water, because Starliner is designed to land on the surface or on land. And there are actually five different locations that they can select from to land in the Western United States. This includes two locations in New Mexico, one location in Arizona, one location in Utah, and one location in California. So depending on their orbital parameters, they can target different landing zones on the United States. But ultimately, this process entailed re-entering the atmosphere first, which would require the heat shields to be able to withstand temperatures up to 1650 degrees Celsius. And then as it reached an altitude of nine kilometers, the forward facing heat shield, or essentially the top, would be released and then allow for the drogue chutes to deploy. At this point, shortly later, the main parachutes would deploy, followed by the main heat shield being dropped by underneath, and then at an altitude of roughly 900 meters, the airbags underneath the vehicle would inflate. And these airbags are designed to help absorb the impact with the ground or to make it so that the forces at landing aren't as intense. Because if you don't have airbags, it might be a little bit more of a jolt. Therefore, it dampens those forces. And ultimately, the OFT-2 mission was able to safely land in New Mexico, ending the mission as a whole. So now that we've talked about OFT-2 in great detail, we can talk about the future of Boeing's Starliner capsule. Now you might be wondering, how many more times will it launch? And currently, NASA has contracted at least seven more launches of Boeing Starliner, one of which will be the crewed flight test, and that is gonna be the last step in certifying Starliner before operational missions. Alongside of this contract is Boeing's contract to provide six crewed missions to the International Space Station, each of which providing four seats for astronauts. Therefore, there's definitely gonna be a lot more Starliner missions coming up in the future, as this is all a part of the commercial crew program alongside of SpaceX's Crew Dragon. 
So we can expect these to occur at a pretty quick frequency over the coming years. However, when will that first launch happen? But from what I've seen so far, it looks like NASA and Boeing are pretty happy with the results of OFT2. Therefore, I would expect the crewed flight test, or CFT, to occur either later this year in 2022 or early next year in 2023, in which two astronauts will fly the Boeing Starliner to the International Space Station, very similar to what SpaceX's Demo 2 did back in the year 2020. So it'll be interesting to see going forward how exactly Starliner as well as Crew Dragon operate in the coming years. As there are many contracts settled with these vehicles, I expect to see them going interchangeably throughout the years to come. So ultimately, it'll be exciting to see both of these vehicles in operation. If you have any questions about OFT2, Boeing Starliner, or the Commercial Crew Program, feel free to let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to this channel. But with all that being said, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.